Is it right? Not right. Okay. It's time for day four of bioinformatics, uh, our final lecture. We are about to leave the world of sequencing behind, but we have just a little bit left that we must discuss. Tomorrow we'll be talking about protein identification and protein structure, which is quite a change of pace from where we are now. So, um, with, with nothing else said, let us enter the fine world of gene expression and differentiation. I want to say that when I first started teaching a bioinformatics class back about 2007 or so, um, I found microarrays deeply mysterious. And for the first couple of years, I always looked for one of my colleagues to teach that lecture. <coughs> At first, I worked with Sean Levy, who directed the microarray facility at Vanderbilt. And later, I turned to my colleague, Bing Zhang. So Bing Zhang taught me a lot of what I know about how to make sense of microarray data. Uh, so let's, let's go ahead and move ahead. I, I borrowed some of the, my slides from Bing, which is why I, I bring him up here. So we're going to talk about gene expression being measured via microarrays. What is the purpose for measuring gene expression? What, what does this technology allow us to do? Uh, and from there, we're going to talk about some of the increased flexibility that becomes possible when we turn away from microarrays and instead work with RNA sequencing, massive uh, uh, RNA-seq experiments carried out by massively parallel sequencers. You can also call them next-gen sequencers, and it's not going to hurt my feelings. We will then discuss normalization, bias, and bi-clustering. These are three approaches that you so frequently see used with, uh, with gene expression data. And from there, we're going to move on to a little preview of a topic that we will hit again if you're in the biostatistics module with me, to talk about the difference testing and multiple testing correction problems, statistical problems. Uh, as you can see on screen, we're, we're going to be passing through a rather different part of our graph. We, we've started with the first two days on these first two tracks, but now we're moving aside to RNA-seq and transcript microarrays used for differentiation, multiple testing correction, and maybe even classifier construction. We won't spend a whole lot of, of time on that last topic. But it's worth your knowing that these things exist and they connect together in this way. So let's start with the fact that gene expression matters tremendously. You cannot answer every biological, a biological question by sequencing a genome. This, uh, because we can sequence genomes, we sequence them left, right, up and down. We have all kinds of different species underway with their sequences right now. But to measure gene expression is another, cat another kettle of fish, because when we look at gene expression, it's no longer the case that essentially every cell in that organism will have the same gene expression. They may have the same genome, but what's getting expressed in those cell types can be quite different. That can happen uh, as a difference between mutant cells and wild type cells, and mutant cells in this case could be things like tumors, tumors that bear mutations that are different from uh, what the rest of the, the person's genome looks like. You could have a, a gene difference in response to a stimulation, such as drugs, maybe uh, anti-cancer drugs used on a cell line, for example. Whether uh, you, you have light taking place, a uh, uh, light uh, incident on the object in question, or whether you've slept. Have any, have any of you wondered how your gene expression gets modified if you sleep four hours as opposed to eight? Get your sleep, folks. It's really mad. It matters a lot. I don't, I don't function with less than say, six hours. Anyway. You may get this at different developmental stages. You could be looking at a, a particular cell as development takes place for, a, for an embryo, for example. You might see that different cell types within the same organism are going to have very different behaviors. So fibroblasts, muscle cells, right? You, could, you can see lots of differences there. The, the, need of, the, the need for particular gene products is quite different in a neuron than it is in a skin cell, right? So, um, you can see that, and in, in general, a disease state and healthy state are, are going to see different kinds of behavior. We have some generalized responses, for example, to different kinds of diseases. Inflammation is one of these things that shows up all the time. So you might see that um, just any disease versus healthy will show uh, similar patterns. So when we look at these questions, we are, we are asking essentially how many messenger RNAs are present for a particular gene. Now, that can also be diced up, as we saw this morning, that you may not just be asking about the number of transcripts for uh, a given, uh, the number of copies of, different, of, of any transcripts for a gene, but rather the number, of, trans uh, the number of, of transcripts seen for each transcript possible for a gene. 
different isoforms may be present at different levels. So you can get a little review of those over uh, in this 2013 cell paper. Um, but for just a moment, I realize that not everyone may remember the structure of a, a gene and how they differ between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. All right, so which are we? Which one are we, prokaryotes, eukaryotes? Eukaryotes, great. What's our friend, Mycobacterium tuberculosis? Prokaryote. What about the yeast? Yeast. Yeast is a eukaryote. E. coli? Okay. Okay, great. So we're in a good place. Now, let's talk about the fact that we have operon-based uh, structure for genes in a lot of prokaryotes. So, you may have a particular gene that's got untranslated regions here and here, and then we see that we have these things called ORFs. Does anyone remember what ORF stands for? Open reading for us. Okay. I won't try to fool you on that one. Untranslated region right here. So, we have one promoter that creates one messenger RNA that spans multiple genes to be expressed. So one operon has one transcript that comes from it, and from it we get two different protein coding regions. That will later be translated independently. Anyone know what this RBS stands for? Ribosomal binding site, exactly. So one messenger RNA has two different places for docking. Okay, now produce that, that transcript, uh, sorry, that translation in, in amino acids, and off you go. So you have one transcript produced, multiple uh, proteins produced from it. This is a little different than eukaryotes. Now, I, um, I realize that the, the term we use for this structure has changed a little bit. Back when I took cell biology in 1992, we called that a heterogeneous nuclear RNA. But I, I see here that this diagram just uses the term uh, pre-mRNA. We'll go with that. Now we have a gene that it contains both exon sequences and intron sequences. Initially, a messenger RNA is created, a pre-mRNA is created, that contains both the intron and exon sequences. And it may even contain some extra stuff that gets carved off of here. So at the end, this exon, this edge right here, is joined to this part of the exon sequence. This exon uh, boundary connects onto that exon boundary, and we see that we have a transcript that has spliced out the intron sequences. This, in turn, gets subjected to translation. We get our chain of amino acids. It folds up and does its thing. Okay? So we have a transitional step here where some, some mixing and, match, mixing and matching, can, matching can take place. If you have a complex enough series of introns and exons, you may see that cells use different pathways through these exons under different stimuli. So, with different transcripts possible for a gene, we can, we can see a shift in these uh, from one uh, set of exon uh, connections to another given stimuli. All right, so that is, that's a, a big difference, and, and we don't really see anything like a cistronic structure with eukaryotes. Okay. So, when we, when we look at high-throughput transcriptome profiling, we want to measure the set of messenger RNA molecules, the transcripts that are produced in these cells. Ultimately, that's a count. There's some physical number of these messenger RNAs that are present in the cell. However, we use two different strategies for measuring this. One is dependent on hydrogen bonding. So when we talk about hybridization, we're talking about two single-stranded DNAs that have complementary sequences that form hydrogen bonds between the bases. That's hybridization. So if you have mismatches in those sequences, they certainly don't, they don't uh, hybridize together nearly as well. Uh, but the, the, when, we, when we measure in something like a microarray, we're measuring the extent to which the, these probe sequences have hybridized to uh, messenger RNA-derived sequences from cells. So in this case, the, the because the DNA has formed the, this, hybrid, this, uh, this hybrid strand and has a, a dye on it, we're going to get some fluorescent intensity that we measure for it. We're using intensity here, the intensity of light coming from this fluorescent marker, as a proxy for abundance. Remember, I said there's some physical number of messenger RNAs per cell for this gene. In this case, we're using that light brightness to tell us roughly 
whether there's more or less. Okay, next up, in RNA-seq approaches, we're using a direct count again. So we are attempting to count, on the basis of sequenced reads, how many different uh, reads map to a particular transcript. So where this is kind of a continuously distributed number, and at a light intensity, this is much more about count. We can say physically we saw five different reads that map to this transcript. They're kind of different categories of information to receive in response, and to some extent the statistical models reflect that. Now, I want to note that we frequently call these DNA microarrays, which might seem a little squirrely given that what we want to measure is transcripts. What are transcripts made out of? Single-stranded RNA. So we're going to measure them in cDNA form instead. So complementary DNA is used because RNA is a little squirrely. If you sneeze at it, it's gone. So you want to have a nice stable signal you can measure, and DNA, as it turns out, is a little bit, a little bit more robust to this kind of thing. If you were to hold some RNA in your hand, it would rapidly be gone because your skin still has RNAs uh, that can break this stuff up. So let us start with our friend, the RNA. We have some primer here that is laying down near its three prime end. That primer lets us build a complementary strand of DNA in this direction. We can then make primers to the cDNA that we built and from that construct amplified DNA where before we had only single-stranded RNA. So we are manufacturing a cDNA that's complementary to our RNA strand because when we lose that RNA through some uh, a digestive process, we'll still have the cDNA from which we can derive our sequence. So in the end, what we sequence in our sequencer in an RNA-seq experiment is a cDNA. If we are working in a microarray, what we're sticking to the, the probe sequences is, again, cDNA. We're using that cDNA as our proxy for uh, messenger RNA because we think the messenger RNA will probably have its numbers distorted quite a lot if we uh, simply rely on it for our signal. But there's another benefit here as well. We can also include some amplification in this step. And our PCR methods are, generally speaking, useful for DNA only. So if we are able to convert to cDNA, we're not only going to have a more stable molecule, but we'll be able to have many logs more of that molecule to measure. OK, so now that we've explained why I'm going to be talking about DNA for the rest of this time, even though what we're measuring is transcription, Let's talk about DNA microarrays. Well, where do DNAs come from? Uh, my DNA microarrays come from? You can actually read about this history. Now, when, at the time I entered grad school, uh, everyone thought microarrays were the bee's knees, and they were flocking into that field from everywhere. Obviously, some of that ardor has, has cleared now. My people are not flooding into microarrays because, in many respects, people think of microarrays as a done technology, that it's over. Everyone wants to do RNA-seq now, even though microarrays are a whole lot cheaper for accomplishing your measurements. So let's talk about that. So a DNA microarray is a solid support, a glass slide, or perhaps a silicon chip, on which a DNA of known sequence is deposited in a regular grid-like array. OK. Who has heard of Cartesian coordinates? Cartesian coordinates. No one's heard of Cartesian coordinates. That's all right. You've used them a lot. Um, anytime you produce an xy plot where you've got some points and you're, it, you're locating them uh, where x is found on, on this <coughs> axis and the y value is found on this axis and where those lines meet, that's where you plot the point. That's a Cartesian coordinate system. Do you know why we call it Cartesian? I think therefore I am. Rene Descartes. René Descartes was the philosopher and mathematician who invented uh, Cartesian coordinates as a way to visualize these data. So uh, when, we, when you think about a DNA microarray, I want you to think about a Cartesian coordinate system, a bunch of x values, a bunch of y values, and at each intersection, we're going to have a bunch of probe sequences. 
So each of those coordinates within that xy plane is going to have a different batch of probe sequences there. And we're only measuring for one particular product at each of these xy coordinates. So you may have a thousand different, uh, a thousand uh, strands of DNA, a, a, a single strand of DNA sticking out of the surface at this point, but there are a bunch of copies of the same thing. Now, we have them arranged in this careful grid because each of those is an address. And when we see light emitting from that address, we know that we have that another, double, another single strand has come in there and hybridized successfully with that patch. So when we see light at a particular patch, we want to be able to say, oh, that represents the primer sequence, blah, blah, blah. Everyone sees that? Okay. So one of the things that should immediately occur to you is that the closer together you can make these patches, the more different, the, the more uh, sequences you can look for in the sample at the same time. But what happens if you put these patches so close together that you can't tell whether the light is coming from this one or that one? Not very viable. So we have these questions about resolution, both in how we synthesize an array and how we read the information from it. Everyone feel good about that? Okay, great. So, in the old school uh, days, we would use spotted or printed arrays. Somebody may have found 2,000 different transcripts from <coughs> Reddit, for example. And they had carefully prepared sequences for these 2,000, and they had a freezer full of just probe sequences for Reddit. So they could then synthesize, uh, oh, sorry, they could then uh, uh, print an array using techniques like your inkjet printer uses. Does anyone use an inkjet printer? Inkjet printer, I remember the inkjets and stuff like that. All right, that's fine. In the old days, if you wanted to print in color, you weren't going to spring for four or $5,000 on a color, print, a color laser printer. You were going to buy yourself an inkjet because they were dirt cheap. And you could print your photos right there at home. It was all grand, an inkjet printer. The nice advantage of inkjet technology is that you can print very, very small dots. You know, 1,200 dpi, whatever. And so these vials of rabbit, DNA, uh, of rabbit transcript that, uh, sequences that were sitting in someone's freezer could be uh, printed onto an array by spraying them on there, essentially. So these spotted or printed arrays were mean that these uh, probe sequences were physically transferred from a plate or reservoir. I always think Eppendorf tubes on this score. And transferred to a solid support, typically a chemically modified glass microscope slide. You've got your glass slide, you've got some sort of chemical modification on it that allows you to stick these sequences on there at one end, preferentially. And then you deposit them in place, you've created your microarray. Now, that's quite different than the synthesized array. And we're going to spend a fair bit of time uh, on the next slide talking about those. Because the, the technology that we use for synthesizing arrays is actually, in my view, uh, nearly, nearly uh, miraculous. So, we can talk here about uh, microarrays from NimbleGen, Affymetrics, and Combinatrix. There's a little bit of a discussion about <coughs> who should be credited by, with the invention of the microarray. Stephen Fodor gets an awful lot of credit for this and was uh, heavily involved in the creation of some new companies in this space. But Edward Southern also shows up. Does anyone recognize that name, Edward Southern? Southern. The Southern Blot, exactly. Creator of the Southern Blot also had quite a, quite a bit to do in creating the microarray. So let's have a quick chat about one of the most amazing things humanity can do. Who has a CPU handy? Anyone have a CPU on you? Central processing unit? Remember those things, CPUs? <laughs> Anyone have one? Okay, well the computer obviously has a CPU, right? Your phone obviously has a, has a CPU in it. CPUs are everywhere. But how do they get so bloody small? These days, we can print a transistor at a size of something like 15 microns. Are my numbers already out of date? Is it smaller than that now? I don't know. They're small. Really small. So, printing transistors at that size is not something that you do by carefully carving on, on uh, silicon dioxide. That's not how it works. What we use is a technique called photolithography. And photolithography, in my view, is one of the most amazing technologies that's ever shaped mankind. So let us start with a silicon chip. 
Um, we know that we want to build DNA on these, on these chips. So we have primers on the surface to which we can build DNA. But first, we're going to mask that surface. So we have a surface on which we could build DNA, but instead, we're going to mask it all. Think about like priming your wall, right? Getting ready for a good layer of paint. But the thing is that this mask prevents us from adding anything to build up these sequences. So what we do is use a laser focused very, very narrowly on these tiny little 10 micron patches or whatever, and we burn a hole through that mask at, a loca at only the locations <coughs> where we want to add the nucleotide A, for example. Okay, so I burn off a hole in all of the, in the patches, but only those patches where the first letter will be A. Then, I flood the mixture with, a, uh, with the ability to add, uh, with, with chemicals that will add one A nucleotide, and that's it. Okay, so I've, now all the, the, these probe sequences that should start with A now have an A residue plumped down on them. And now, once again, I'm going to remask that whole surface. At this point, the only, probe, the only sites on that, on that, on that uh, silicon that have a, an A, that have any nucleotides for that matter, are those that start with A. Maybe for the next round, I decide to deposit a C. Now, some of these places don't have any nucleotides on them at all. So, the ones that should have a C as the first letter now get deprotected by burning little holes in them with our laser. And in some cases, where we have probe sequ sequences that start with A, C, I'm now going to burn off the mask so I can add another letter to it. Now I flood the, flood the uh, silicon with the letter C, and that sequence sits down on the base plate for those that start with C, and those that start with A, C now have A and C stacked on them. This sounds deeply implausible, but this is how we've been making, micro, uh, how we've been making micro, uh, microprocessors for eons. The difference is that we've gotten better and better at making smaller and smaller features. Where a decade ago you might talk about making a 130 micron transistor, now you can do it at a tenth the size. Shocking. So the same benefits in photolithography, the name of this, uh, the name of this technology, that have benefited us in making faster processors, because the smaller the transistor, the less heat it produces, have also benefited us in making high-density microarrays. We are, we are building chain, single-stranded chains of DNA on the very surface of silicon. Astonishing. Absolutely astonishing. So photolithography is this name. Photolithography. Photo is a Greek root. Anyone know what it stands for? Light. Thank you. Yes, photons are light particles. So photo refers to light. This is the laser shining on this thing. Lith. 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 Anyone know what that is? What's that? Earth. I, I think rock, but yeah, same thing. So we have uh, a thing of the soil in this case, the silicon wafer that we are building onto. So we're building on a rock. So light and rock, and then the last part of it is graphy. Graphy. Many of you are busily graphing right now. Writing, exactly. So writing with light on rocks is what photolithography means. And here we are building sequences on rock. We're writing sequences on rock using lasers. Amazing technology. So there you have it. Photolithography has in large part won in a lot of respects uh, in the ability to create highly dense microarrays with custom sequences at each location. We don't have to keep little vials of the probes to be stuck on each of these locations. We can build it right on the chip. Amazing. Okay, on we go. How do these experiments work? Here's a, here's a very brief look. Um, imagine that we have bought our DNA microarrays. This is really how it works. Maybe you're working with a core facility and they have a bunch of these instruments set up. They have purchased these microarrays for you. I have now isolated messenger RNA from the biological samples I want to compare. I reverse transcribe because we're going to build a complementary DNA 
to the single-stranded messenger RNA, we can label this cDNA by incorporating a fluorescently labeled nucleotide. All right, so we have a bit of a ringer on this. We didn't just make a cDNA from the messenger RNA. We also labeled it with fluorescent dye. That means when we hit it with the laser, it gives us light. And that gives us something we can measure. All right, so then we need to hybridize our labeled cDNA to the DNA microarray. Hybridization takes place because we have bonds forming between these two single-stranded DNAs. And those are hydrogen bonds. So we have a hybridization event here that's led to duplexes. But remember, we labeled our cDNA. So when we wash off all the excess cDNA, we can scan this microarray with a laser. And where that laser strikes, if there's a, a large quantity of labeled cDNA there, we're going to get a nice bright signal. OK? So much of the time, when we think about old school microarrays, we would often think about these diagrams of red dots and green dots and yellow dots. And we would always think to ourselves, OK, pro, uh, the genes, that are, the, the transcripts that are turned on in just the red, the red cohort uh, have red colors. The genes that are turned on only in the green cohort are going to light up in green. But the ones that light up in both colors together are emitting both red and green light. And to our eyes, that looks what? Yellow. yellow. Brilliant. Red plus green equals yellow. All right. So that used to be the strategy that really drove microarrays because you could compare two samples on each microarray. But over the long haul, mono, uh, uh, monocolor, uh, <laughs> monochrome uh, uh, technologies are more frequently used. So the cost of a microarray is so cheap that we can use a different microarray for each sample. So a lot of the time, we see that our microarray experiments are using a different array for each sample. Um, this is kind of the same workflow as we were just talking about. But again, we're, we're, we're starting from uh, polyadenylated RNA. We use primers to create cDNAs. We label them in some way. These are bi labeled And we can then um, check the hybridization to our microarray. OK, was there a question that I heard? OK, great. On we go. Now, as a, as a bioinformaticist, I just have to say, sequencers ruin everything. Hmm. People liked microarrays. They could make sense of the data from microarrays. Microarrays had gotten cheap. They were wonderful, and everyone could count on them, and we had good statistical models for making sense of them, and then the sequencer hit. Well, wouldn't it be better, people said, if instead of using hybridization to measure whether this thing was present or not present, we could instead look at the sequences directly. So RNA-seq was derived. Now, um, I, I borrowed some figures here from papers in 2010 and 2011. I, I really like this one, actually. So I want you to think again about patches of sequence. These are reads. These reads are produced at random locations within transcripts. What we see in this case is that we have some incompatible sets of these sequences. This green section, this green set of reads can be assembled into this sequence. These red ones can be seen as part of this sequence. And yet we also have this kind of reference sequence hanging about in there as well. So in effect, if we decide to go off on the green trail, we don't come back to the black trail. This reflects that there are, uh, there are different sets of exons being stitched together in these to produce forks in the road. As we, as we transcribe this gene, which one uh, ends up getting assembled uh, for, uh, as, a, as the final messenger RNA will depend upon which exons get spliced together. In this case, we have a, an exon in red that forks off for a while from the black sequence, but then comes back together again. So maybe the, this particular gene has one model in which it can add a single exon in this particular gap, or it may add these two other exons in that gap. And so you have the, the red sequence following the path of the other two exons, and the, the black path following the single, uh, single black exon. 
So that's quite the story. Yeah, at the end, our ability to tell these stories is, is kind of confounded by the fact that most of the, the patches of sequence that we derive are on one path or the other. And they're not very long. So if you want to capture the actual exon-exon boundaries, you're depending upon having a read that covers that particular narrow stretch. So we're chopping up the, we're chopping up the picture in order to do the sequencing, and then we're trying to reconstruct how these transcripts branch, and, uh, branch away and come back together again from that. So there are three major strategies that we use for making sense of these data. I've already talked about one of these a fair bit. You remember my friend the chia plant, right? Our, our chia plant, we don't know anything. We have an RNA-seq experiment, but we don't have a reference annotation. We don't know what the whole genome sequence looks like. Nor do we have gene models. Gene models. I don't really use that term, but I want to point out that we've already been talking about them. You remember our friends the hidden markup models? Hidden markup, HMMs. We use HMMs to recognize sets of exons and, and, and introns in a genetic sequence. And from that, we're able to put together a model of which bits of genome we have to stitch together in order to create which transcript for this gene. So let's, let's talk through these three different models. Number one, if you have no reference genome whatsoever, you can simply overlap these bits of these patches of sequence derived from the transcripts and do a de novo assembly to generate your gene model. This is what the full transcript looks like based on my reference-free de novo assembly. Sometimes that's what you've got. You haven't got a better tool to use. Sometimes you have a reference sequence for the genome, but you're not very trusting about your gene models. In fact, the whole reason you might be doing the RNA-seq experiment is that you want to improve your gene models. You want to say, well, where are the exons that actually get used in this, in this particular tissue? So you could then look at these tags and figure out where they map to the genome sequence. But you see these, these little stretched out ones. What's going on with that? In this case, we have a sequence that, that has a bit of sequence on either side of an intron boundary. So for us to align that optimally to the, the reference genome, we've got to insert this long break in it. So in effect, this is, this is a read, and this is a read, and this is a read, but this one, we've had to add this big spine extender into it in order to get it to, to match to a patch over here and to patch over here. So in effect, this is something that we would use to infer the gene structure, the gene model itself. Now, if you're dealing with human RNA-seq data, we know our gene models really bloody well at this point. We're not going to produce as much RNA sequence as, say, the ENCODE project did way back when. So we have very good gene models that inform us about what set of isoforms, what set of transcripts, may be seen for each gene. And when we try to figure out how these tags align, we don't have to go all the way back to the reference sequence. We can just compare it to the set of known transcripts to see where they align. So a lot of what you see in RNA-seq comes down to this kind of model. One of the things that using all of this available information can accomplish is that you may allow for inexact matching. So remember that if you're doing an RNA sequencing experiment, you may find some transcripts that disagree in sequence at, at a few locations with what the gene reference says should be there. So this is a very powerful model for us to work from, especially when you have a very well annotated genome. Okay. I tried to boil this down to a table, but we'll, we'll see how, how much mileage we get from it. Do we want to use RNA-seq, or do we want to use microarrays? We start by saying that we might only be interested in gene expression. Basically, how much is this on, how much is that on, how much is this other thing on? That's a quantifying, a quantifying uh, gene expression. If that's what you're interested in, microarrays are perfectly content to deliver that for you. However, you might be interested in seeing variant forms of a gene that are getting transcribed and recognizing those sequences that differ from what your annotation says should be there. If so, you better use RNA-seq. 
On microarrays, we can quantify expression on an exon level or a gene level. A lot of people th don't notice that, but there are, mi there are microarrays that contain patches for uh, uh, probe sequences for each exon, which means that we can recognize what combination of exons is turned on for this tissue. It's sometimes called an exon array. RNA-seq is going to give us that information as well, in counts rather than intensities, but not, uh, actually better in a lot of respects. What about the unknown? PIs are really good at asking uh, the questions about, well, what is it that we're not seeing? And with a microarray, you're going to be left sitting with that question. If you want to know about what other sequences might be present in these messenger RNAs, you're probably going to need to do the sequencing experiment. And frankly, if you're doing a big microarray experiment, you might consider doing RNA-seq on a hundredth of the samples, because you'll, you'll get a little bit of information from them to see what was missing. All right, now analysis. Here we've got our one-word answers, and I hope you'll forgive me for that. Analyzing microarray data sets is easy. You, you saw this morning that when you have a data set in the repository, you can actually just automate the cohort differentiation process. That's pretty easy. Um, if you're dealing with RNA-seq, don't expect to experience anything like that. Interpretation. Well, which of the sequence variants that you found by RNA-seq do you trust? What are the <laughs> rationale that you use for including this variant but excluding that variant? Troublesome. So interpretation is difficult. Microarrays, it's easy. It's routine, right? What's the assay cost? The assay cost is what it costs to do an individual sample. These numbers are old. These are pretty glacial at this point. So I, I don't know how much I would trust these numbers. Besides, they're in dollars. Who cares what the dollar's worth in this country, right? So generally speaking, let us say that microarrays are cheaper than RNA-seq. The prices uh, have been cheaper than RNA-seq. On the other hand, people use sequencing like it's going out of style. As a result, with this many customers, and this, uh, that company, countries and, and institutions are really investing in sequencer technology. Therefore, the odds are, at this point, your university is more likely to have a sequencing facility than it is to have a microarray facility, even though the other is a whole lot easier to deal with. So, the cost may not be what decides you uh, on which of these two technologies you, you would use you may be trapped more or less by which facility is available to you to use. The CAF sequencing facility over on the Stellenbosch campus has sequencers <coughs> ready to go. Carl is happy to talk to you. So, the data cost. What's this data cost? Do you have to pay for your data? Where does that come from? Anyone work with a core facility for some purpose? A few people have, and they're, they're giving this sort of wise nod right now. Data cost. One of the first things you should think about is, can you recover your data from the facility? In many cases, you will find that sequencing data are rather hard to get because they are big. We already looked at some examples of old sequencing data, and we saw that the individual paired end reads were like a gigabyte a piece, zipped. With new sequencers, they're even bigger. And in some cases, you may just have to show up at the facility with a big hard drive and say, let me have it, because getting it over the network could be painful. You think I'm kidding. I'm not. So that's the first thing. Getting the data can, can be cumbersome and require you to show up with a hard drive. The second piece of this is that the core facility may decide that any project that, ha that hasn't been asked about in two years or so will have its files erased. I, I heard some people sort of gasp on that one, but in fact it's true. The, the core facilities here cannot keep all the sequencing data they generate or all the mass spectrometry data they create in perpetuity. They have bills to pay, and they can't just keep adding on more and more hard drives to the file servers. So what we see is that generally these data just vanish after a while. So the data management cost suddenly becomes borne by the person who asked for that experiment to be done. Right now, I am working with a PI in our division who is very frustrated about the paper he's trying to write about this work because the postdoc who generated the data didn't leave a copy behind. 
uh, and the postdoc hasn't an isn't answering emails. <laughs> so sometimes you'll find orphan projects become very difficult to resurrect and get published, darn it, in the end, simply because the data management is so problematic. And stuff happens. Uh, I wanted to mention, I, I don't talk about it a lot in this particular talk, but uh, how we measure the amount of expression on a given transcript is, has kind of a complex story behind it. You will frequently see terms like RPKM and FPKM and even TPM uh, mentioned for this. I've, been, I've given a blog entry here that kind of talks about that story. It's kind of easy to talk about for us in its intensities. Everyone, everyone kind of gets their, their heads wrapped around the idea that brighter is better. But RPKM and FPKM are kind of more challenging concepts. Feel free to read that blog entry if you want to know more about it. So where does bioinformatics and all this? I spent a lot of time there just talking about gene expression. We're already sitting at 3 o'clock. So there's plenty of work for bioinformatics. I want to start with the fact that science is supposed to work in a great virtuous cycle, a self-reinforcing cycle. At the start, imagine a, a sage bio, a, a sage biologist sitting in his or her office, stroking the non-existent beard, and saying, gosh, I wonder why X happens. What are, what are the circumstances under which X happens? A biological question is born. A hypothesis is arrived at after some reading and consultation and asking the postdoc, let's be honest. This hypothesis can then be tested by specific aims, so we can write a grant, so we get funded, and now we can run the experiment to test the hypothesis. Brilliant. All of this gets us an experimental design. We can do our transcript, transcriptome pup profiling, either RNA-seq or microarray, either way around. And then we have a bunch of bioinformatics. At the end of the day, we see whether our hypothesis stood the test of time. We refine our hypothesis with yet another. We, we do a little pre-work to ensure that this hypothesis is worth its water. And we're right back at the top again. This is the, the ever-going cycle, the virtuous cycle of, bio, of, of, of biological experimentation. But look at all these different steps before we can get to biological interpretation of, our, of, our, uh, of the data that we've generated. We're going to try to walk through some of this, but we'll, we'll try to do it very, very carefully because some of these pieces um, apply in a large number of contexts. So let us start with normalization. Who here has heard the term batch effect? Batch effect. Not many. That's interesting. So batch effects are, uh, are reasons why one batch of your experiments might look different than another batch. To give, to give a really awful example, imagine that I'm doing a case cohort study, right, a case control cohort study. So I have a bunch of healthies and a bunch of sicks and I'm going to run a bunch of samples from case and a bunch of samples from control. And from that, I'm going to learn how case and control differ. Everyone sees that model. Okay, now let us imagine that I am a, a not thoughtful person. And in my experiment design, I say, well, I'm going to get one tranche of money from my grant in uh, July, and I'm going to do all of the control experiments. Then I'm going to get another tranche of money in January. And then I'm going to do all of my case, my case experiments. What happened between July and January? As we imagine, that, as, as sand in the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. Time is passing. Calendar pages are vanishing off into the distance. And who knows what's going on with that instrument? What if the instrument was bright and shiny in July, and in January, Somebody's samples dirtied it up. Now it might appear that my controls all have very strong gene expression, and all of my cases now have very weak gene expression, not because of the biology of the samples, but because time has passed and the instrument got cruddy. That is a batch effect. You never want a batch effect. You never want technical variability to overcome the biological variability of your samples. You want the biology to speak for itself without technology getting in the way. 
So I already had a very bad idea by doing my, my two cohorts at completely different times. That is already likely to totally destroy any results I might have from this experiment. And yet, some very major researchers have published articles using data that had batch effects of that magnitude. Like I said, you always have to be careful when you're reading the literature. You must read it with a skeptical eye, and occasionally try to reproduce their results with their data. Okay, so there may be many reasons why we have technical variation. The machine may be cruddy. Your, uh, your experimental conditions, maybe it's winter when you do one and summer when you do the other, bad news. Maybe you had a really old batch of urea, and it's got a little uric acid and stuff going on in it, bad news. Experimenter bias. Now, why would you have experimenter bias up here? We're all very objective people. Well, no, we're not. You, as a graduate student, would like your research to get published. That means you need a significant p-value somewhere. <laughs> and it's definitely the case that occasionally we see people making inadvertent mistakes. When you're using your pipette man, maybe pressing a little extra firmly on one cohort than another. Stuff like that makes a difference. So, it could be that you're going to see differences in your gene levels that have nothing to do with the biology of those samples. Normalization is one of the ways that we can remove systematic variation, systematic variation from sources like this, that could otherwise bias our measured gene expression. Okay, so what can that look like? I, I love this figure. I realize that sometimes it, it causes people grief. Now, if you'll remember this morning in the practical, we were looking at the uh, value ranges for different microbes. Remember, we had a 19 versus 19 experiment, and we had a, a box plot showing the, the uh, intensity variation within each sample. So I want you to imagine that these are just like that, except these are eight, and that's fine. So here we have our median value, here we have our, uh, our 25th uh, percentile, our 75th percentile. This is kind of our standard range, then we've got a whole bunch of outliers way up above it. Okay, so this could be comparable just as it is, but quite frequently we will see that people will want to uh, try to make the data look as much alike as possible so that when they see a gene difference, they, it's not coming from technical variation, but rather from biological variation. So one of the approaches that we use is designed to make these medians sit down all in a run, all in a line like that. So one of the things you can do is ask, what is the median of all of these intensity values? And then you can ask, what do I have to multiply each experiment by to force its median to be at the same level? Right? So before, this median's a little high, this one's even higher, that's way high, that's way down, etc. We're now going to force all those medians to one horizontal line. So you can simply multiply each intensity in each experiment by an experiment-specific multiplier that shoves all the medians to the same place. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. It is not, however, uh, going to guarantee that the distribution of the data around those medians is comparable. So for that, we may use a, a strategy called quantile normalization. Quantile normalization is a little harder to explain, but let's just say that it makes the shape of each distribution comparable. It forces them to be, whether or not the data want to be. All right, now, I want to note right up here at the top that I've said something controversial, and many of your PIs won't like it. So let's just type, take a quick moment and read that top bullet point. One could adjust these arrays using housekeeping genes. And I've written there, right beside it, not recommended. Not recommended. What I'm saying is that for many years, biologists have told themselves a little white lie. They've said to themselves, well, actin is always on, myosin is always on, blah, 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 blah. This set of 10 genes, every cell needs them. And they assume that those levels of transcription are therefore a good reference for comparing every other uh, in intensity value that we see. This is in fact not so. Lots of papers that have investigated whether the housekeeping gene approach is viable have said it's not any good. 
So if you normalize by housekeeping genes in microarrays or whatever you want, you're probably going to run into some problems because you may end up introducing variability into your experiments rather than reducing it. Okay, there are other people who are much more uh, equipped to, to talk about this point. If you'd like your PI to talk to Gerard Trump on the subject, I'm sure he'd make time for it. Housekeeping genes suck, don't do it. Okay, let us talk then about the Bland-Altman problem. Here's a little hypothesis for you. Oh, yes, question. Uh, I'm wondering how can you be able to normalize the housekeeping gene? Uh, is it like you can be able to regulate the expression of housekeeping? Well, the whole point of the housekeeping gene approach yeah, is right. the idea that housekeeping genes don't move. Um, so you could simply sum together the intensity for every housekeeping gene on your list and then divide every intensity by that number. You can do that. My, my point is that, that that actually introduces variability that you don't see. Yeah. Oh, yes? Um, I'm sorry, I'll drop that as slide. Yeah. Can you use the point for normalization to so on like real time PCR? Are you looking at gene expression? I'd I mean, expect they, so. Do they often use reference? I would, I would expect so, sure. Yeah. Why not? Because yeah, it's really popular using housekeeping genes in yeah. real time. So. Yeah. Bring Gerard into that conversation because he's he's got very broad experience. Ben's got two hundred publications. You know, he just knows stuff. You know what? I, I I'll just mention I applied for the same job as Gerard got. I was one of the finalists, and I was like, "Darn it! Don't they want a Vanderbilt professor to come down there?" And when I when I met the guy, I realized, oh. He is the Alpha Geek. <laughs> He's amazing. You, you can ask this man about any bird you see in the sky and say, what is that? What's his Latin name? He's there in a moment. He's just astonishing. The man's a naturalist. Isn't that wild? There are a few naturalists among us who can tell you all kinds of amazing things about the natural world. If you're curious about what kind of rock is, is uh, Simon Spock made out of, he's got it. He's just like that. Incredible guy. All right, anyway. On we go. The MA or Bland Altman plot. What if you have a bias in your data? Imagine that if you have very, very light signals in some parts, some very um, sparse data where you don't have great uh, sensitivity. What if it appears at low intensity that all your genes are a little reddish or a little greenish, if you know what I mean? High in one, higher in one cohort than another. That could be an example of bias. So if, for example, you had better intensity in the, the red cohort, you might see that at, at very low levels of expression, they appear to be regulated in favor of the red cohort. That's not a great situation. We can spot things like that using an MA plot. So I'm not going to explain really what the M and the A stand for here, but let's, let's start by saying that M is the log difference in signal between two sets for a given gene. All right, so we have the measurement in red, we have the measurement in green, we can take the log difference of the two, it's basically a, a, a kind of one divided by the other more or less. Zero means that they're at one to one. Five here would mean it's, in this case, e to the five upregulated in one. So we're, we're using the vertical position here to say, is this reddish or is this greenish? And then on A, we're using the average intensity for that gene. So down here at the bottom, we'll probably do this on log scale just to make everything kind of squish into one graph. So down here at low intensity, you might see that this shape curls up, right? It could look a little like an apostrophe. It could curl a little bit down. In a case like that, we know that there's a characteristic bias that is a function of average intensity in one direction or the other. If you know the bias exists, you can correct for it. If you don't know the bias exists, mm -hmm. you may end up calling a bunch of genes differential simply because they're at low intensity. Awkward, right? So MA plots help us in that respect. Part of the uh, array normalization uh, uh, guide that I found. All right. Now it's a moment where we, we can start looking at these red-green plots. First off, if you are designing a, a visualization of your data, don't use red and green. Is anyone in this room colorblind? 
It's frequently the case that people are colorblind in a room this size. So it's very common, and the most common type of colorblindness in men is red versus green. So this plot probably doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense to some people who are looking at it. So that said, bi-clustering is one of the most widely used visualizations of microarray data. I'm going to start by saying we're not going to look at all the genes. We're just going to include those genes that had good variability across these samples. Things that are up all the time, putative housekeeping genes, we're going to screen those right out. We're not going to look at those. Things that are down all the time, we're not going to look at those. We want genes that are variable, that move around a lot. <coughs> then, we can sort our, our different microarrays, each one representing a different sample, by, by uh, which ones show the most similar patterns of intensity across these variable genes. And at the same time, we can sort our genes by those that have similar patterns of expression across samples. Weird, huh? So now, two cell lines are going to be close together if their gene expressions look similar, and genes are going to be sorted together if they're up and down in the same samples. It's freaking amazing. So now we end up with what we call checkerboard patterns, and these checkerboard patterns represent blocks of genes that change expression among the different phenotypes we have in our data sets. So by clustering gives us this look, and it, it helps us to know in an unbiased way which samples have the most similar expressions, which genes are most similar across samples. That's one of the pieces of information you most want to get from this. And I want to point out that when we want to understand which genes are related to each other in function, one of the principal ways we do that is by their correlation in gene expression. So if you see that two different genes, different chromosomes, no idea what they do, happen to go up and down in exactly the same circumstances, you begin to impute a shared function for the two of them. Okay, so bi-clustering is, is this very useful technique. Uh, I want to point out that Cheng and Church published this uh, in 2000. I think there's even an earlier publication than that. And then I borrowed this figure uh, from a paper in 2003. But these techniques are used all the time, so very good to know about bi-clustering. What are we trying to accomplish? Well, let's start by asking a question about genes. We have two, two cohorts, let's say. We've got cancers and not cancers. And we want to know which genes are most specific to cancers. So we could then do this by clustering, for example, to evaluate which genes are most differential. But we need to know which of the samples are, are controls and which ones are cancers. So we're going to use the labels, these class labels, say whether this sample comes from someone with cancer or someone without. And we need to know which genes represent which expression, uh, which expression values are for which genes. Out from this comes our list of genes that are differential. We're going to talk about the statistics of that in two shakes of a lamb's tail. Class detection. Sometimes we don't know what relates these different samples we're dealing with. Uh, and if you have a, a, a bunch of folks and you're trying to figure out, are they all suffering from one disease or do they have different diseases? Clustering can help you out quite a lot. So in this case, we're going to do clustering analysis. We're going to use gene expression data, but we won't really have labels. So what we're hoping to do is to build a hierarchy in which people who have a, a common, uh, common disease are grouped together, and people who don't have that disease are grouped separately. So this, uh, this class detection is one of the ways that we would do this. Now, am I going to go through the problems of learning how to build such discriminant engines? I am not, sadly. I do not have a lecture in this, uh, in this series about machine learning. Machine learning is a difficult topic, but uh, we are going to try to get some course materials put together on that subject. So if you're interested, let me know. Finally, class prediction. This one really, really matters. Think of this as the biomarker question. Let us say that I am interested in household contacts of people who have TB. Somebody back home has TB. This person lives in the same space. Does that mean that I need to be concerned that this person has, who has a household contact is also going to come down with TB? It is an infectious disease, after all. 
So what if I could measure blood samples from people who are going back home to a house with TB in it and know who needs to be monitored extra closely and somebody who I don't need to, to worry about as much? Wouldn't that be handy? Well, we've spent a lot of time in that, in that problem, and I have to say it's a lot harder than you might think to recognize who is most at risk of getting infected with TB. So biomarkers are a big issue. Machine learning is the technique that we most frequently use for it. Um, you, you'd better have a training set uh, in which you're going to uh, use known information about um, labels, who is or is not the household contact. And you'd better have a holdout set a test set that you can use to test out this model on data it hasn't seen before. Okay, so that's just a, a brief discussion of some rather complex places to go with uh, gene expression data. I'm not going to hit them much harder than that. I will, however, talk about statistical analysis. We're going to discuss hypothesis testing. Let us imagine that we have a whole set of probes these are different probes on our microarray surface. Across here, we have samples. I've got a red cohort and I've got a green cohort. My apologies if, you're, uh, if your vision doesn't encompass these colors. So I have three replicates here, I have three replicates here. These are my input data. I want to know which of these probes is different between our two cohorts. That looks like a very simple problem. But it's going to take us into some, some kind of hairy statistical territory. I want you to be prepared for this. So, these genes have these measurements. Which ones are different? Most frequently, the kind of test that we will apply in this case is one of a null hypothesis. So we've got mu and h and so on. So these mu's are mean values. So we have the mean value in the HNE0 set and we have a mean value in the HNE60 set. We are going to hypothesize that they are the same. We're going to hypothesize that they're the same. That is kind of a, a, a weird way to think about it, but this is how our favorite t-test uh, is set up. We're going to assume, or we're going to use the hypothesis that each gene is exactly the same in mean between these two cohorts. The alternative hypothesis covers all other possibilities. Maybe mu1 is greater than mu2. Maybe mu2 is greater than mu1. We don't know. But we're going to start with this hypothesis. And so we want to test uh, to get some figure of merit to say how well does our hypothesis that there's no difference encompass the data we've got. Now, we're going to start with student's t-test. Student uh, was a guy named Gossett, who worked for the Guinness Brewery in, uh, I guess in Ireland, but I don't even know. But uh, he was, because he was working for a beer company, his employer said, we don't want other breweries to know that we've hired a statistician. You're our advantage. So they wouldn't let him publish in his own name. So he published under the name Student. So when we say student's t-test, we are not talking about a test that's available for students or appropriate only for students. It's because it was written by a guy under the name student. This means when you write student's t-test, I don't want to see any one of you writing it with a little s, because student is a proper name. Everyone got that? OK. If I ever review your thesis, I'm going to sit there with my little red pen every time I see student with a little s. I'm just telling you. Total fiend about this one. All right. So, student's t-test is going to assume normality in the data that come into it. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time talking about that right now, but the short version is that we expect the data to be bell-shaped, to have a nice mean value to it, and to be symmetric with bands of variation that include 68% of the data within one standard deviation, 95% of the data within two standard deviations. I could go on and on. We talk about normal distributions all the time. but when you're looking at data, you would like them to be normally distributed if you're going to use a student t student's t-test. Okay, that's it. Man, Whitney's U uh, Man and Whitney's u-test, you also see the name Wilcoxon associated with this, does not depend on how these data are distributed. It only cares how they rank. How they rank. Okay, so let us look at two genes. Gene X 
has the values 961, 1103, 10.5, and in the other cohort, 1144, 1223, 1361. We see that these produce a t-test value of 0.06, the u-test p-value is 0.1. So, under our standard rule of less than 0.05, neither of these is a significant result. But, I want you to notice a very slight change in the data. See this 961, that stays the same. 1103 stays the same, 1050 stays the same, 1144 stays the same, 1223. We're going to just change one value, just one value. Now, the high value for the blue cohort is going to move from 1361 to almost double, 25.61. Look what happens to our p-values. The p-value that was uh, not significant, but you know, in the 0.06 range, suddenly jumps to 0.32. Exactly. And over here, the u-test that produces a p-value that's exactly the same. Exactly the same. That's kind of weird, isn't it? So why is it that showing this point so much higher made a big difference in t-test, but almost no difference in u-test? The reason can be found in the ranks. So in this, we see that all three of these purple values are less than all three of these blue values. At a moment like this, I like to have my jar of black and white marbles sitting next to me. I don't have it. And I also like a little Scrabble rack. You know those little things you put your, your titles on in Scrabble? So I, I would like to imagine then that I have Purple marbles and blue marbles. We can, can we call those purple and blue? Is that more like a lavender? What should I call that? Lavender? Lavac? Pink? Yeah. All right, pink it is. All right. My color perception is not up to scratch today. So we have pink and blue. We'll just call them that. So imagine that I have a pink marble reflecting each intensity in the pink cohort, and I have a light blue cornflower. Cornflower? It's not cornflower. Periwinkle? All right, that's fine. Blue. And I have another blue marble to reflect the intensity in the blue, for the three measurements in the blue cohort. If I have those in a tile rack, in, in one of my Scrabble tile racks, a little trough now, um, I'm going to order them by their intensity values. So the first, the, the lowest value that I've got is right here. The second lowest value that I've got is right here. The third lowest I've got is this one, then this one, then this one, then this one. So effectively, my trough has pink 1, pink 3, pink 2, and then above that, blue 1, blue 2, and blue 3. Everyone sees that, that, that rack I'm holding? I've, I've sorted these values from lowest to highest. One of the things I want to point out here is that all of the blues are above all of the pinks. That's the best you can possibly do in the U-test. Perfect separation of colors based on that. So we can replace the value 961 with just a 1. We can replace 11.03 with a, just a 2. It's second rank. 10.5, we can replace that with a 3. Oh, I'm sorry, I got that backwards. 961 gets 1. 10.5 gets 2, 11.03 gets 3, 11.4 gets 4, etc. So, so long as these colors perfectly separate, we're going to get the lowest possible p-value out of a U-test. Which is why changing this last value from 13.6 to 25.6, it doesn't phase it at all. It just shrugs its shoulders and says, well, it was already the top rank one. It's just as top ranked as it was before. P-values from t-test, on the other hand, take magnitude into account. I've said several times over now that if you're trying to find a difference between things, it's not enough that the means be different. It's that the variation be small enough that you can detect this. When we change this last item from 13.6 to 25.6, we greatly increase the variance in the blue values. As a result, t-test says, whoa, I'm no longer sure I can tell these differences apart. Okay? That's why magnitude matters with t-test, only rank matters with u-test. Okay, so when you have 
uh, uh, when you have outliers in your data, U-Test is going to be more resistant to them because it doesn't really care how much further it is from everything else. It just cares that it's ranked fall in the right place. Efficiency is kind of a problem here. One of the things that should have phased you a moment ago when we were looking at this set was that I said the lowest p-value that's possible for a U-Test in a 3-on-3 comparison is 0 0.1. So if you only have three replicates in each cohort, U-Test is never going to give you a p-value less than 0 0.05. Never. It's not capable of it. So you better have more than three replicates if you're going to use U-Test. So with enough replicates, U-Test is almost as efficient as T-Test. But if you don't have, uh, and if, you, if your data are not normal, T-Test is no longer even an option for you. So let's, what, what does this look like? I, uh, I know I'm not promising to teach you programming, but I'm going to show you a little bit of our code. I, I hope everyone feels good about this. So we're going to start by doing a thousand trials. We're going to compare a thousand different genes and compute t-tests and, and u-tests for them all. In this case, I'm going to uh, create a vector of, of t p-values and u p-values in these two vectors. I'm going to count from 1 to 1,000. I told you I like for loops, right? So we're, we're getting rid of apply for just a moment. We're going to just run it in a for loop. So for each of a thousand trials, I'm going to set up five values of a with a mean of 4. I'm going to sample another five values stored in B that have a mean of six. Now there's some, mis some missing information here, and I'll just say, by default, this R norm function uses a standard deviation of one. So uh, the, the mean difference is two, and the standard deviation is one. There's a fair bit of overlap between these two distributions. And in each case, we're going to write down the p-value from that t-test, and we're going to write down the p-value from the Wilcoxon test, same thing as Man Whitney essentially. So what we do then is graph all of these t-test p-values that resulted and all of the u-test p-values that resulted. In this case, I had a five on five comparison. You saw that right there. These are the number of replicates in each cohort. So we see that the lowest u-value t-tests that we get have a value of like 0.01. So you can, with, with five on five comparisons, you can get a significant looking p-value from a, a u-test. But you see that they're kind of stair-step. I want to explain why, that, why that's true. The t-test gives us this nice smooth curve, but not u-test, u-test will not. So what I want you to think about is five pink and five blue uh, balls on this, on this rack again. What's our best possible p-value that we can get from a u-test? Perfect separation. When you have five balls compared to five balls, you can get a p-value of a little less than 0.01. You can run that comparison on R very quickly. Just say Wilcox test uh, values 1 through 5 versus 6 through 10. That will give you what that p-value is. What's the next best separation you could get for five balls versus five balls? One overlap. See, now... The, uh, the highest pink ball is slightly above the lowest blue ball. So now we have one exchange. The software knows that this is almost as good as it gets, but it's slightly lower. And as a result, it gets a slight reduction in its p-value to the same neighborhood as 0.02. Next, you might have one ball of the reds that's separated by two from the rest of the distribution. You can imagine all these different uh, interlacings of pink and, and blue balls. And of course, the very worst situation is the commingled set. Every other ball is, is, is pink and every other ball is blue. That's terrible. That's no separation at all. Something like that is going to give you values way out here. Well, actually, much worse than that. I'm not showing the top of the distribution. So, um, so to a U-test, how they are ordered makes all the difference. It's a rank-based test. T-test is always going to care about magnitude. As a result, there are many more distinct values that you can get from it. This morning, we used a, li a library in R as, as part of our analysis of the, of the gene expression omnibus data set. 
we used Lima, and I wanted to introduce you to it for a couple reasons. The first is that it's part of Bioconductor. Bioconductor is the breeding ground for good ideas in biostatistics associated with bioinformatics. Basically, if you're in a branch of bioinformatics that's touching statistics heavily, somebody is making a package that relates to what you're doing in Bioconductor. So Bioconductor is a brilliant resource. It's linear models for microarray data, LIMA, is very, very widely used. As we saw, the geo to r uh, library uses it explicitly. One of the things that makes it valuable is that it has an empirical Bayes moderated t-statistic test. That is a rather verbose name. Why does it matter? It matters because our ability to measure variance is actually quite poor. Our ability to estimate variance grows with the more replicates we've got, but really, even five is kind of sketchy for figuring out the variance for a bunch of numbers. So, Lima, in the empirical Bayes moderated t statistic test, is able to find variance using a very large number of genes to figure out what is a typical variance for something in this range of intensity. That means that it can give you a, a, a t statistic and thus a p value that is much more reliable than something that's idiosyncratic. Um, let us imagine that I am uh, making a comparison of three values that are 0.99, 1.01, and 1.03. Those are pretty close together, right? But imagine in my other cohort, I'm looking at 1.1, 1.15, and 1.5, a huge value. In this case, I have unequal variance between my measurements because the ones from that first cohort are packed together very tightly and the ones on the other side are very broad because that weird 1.5 value I threw in there. This unequal variance creates a need for a correction in t-test and frankly, with just three points, you're not really sure where that variance is going. Maybe you've got an outlier, and so the variance is just a misestimate altogether on one side. That's problematic. With moderated t-test, the software has a whole lot more data points for figuring out how variable the data are. Therefore, Lima is going to give you stable p-values that are not going to take advantage of the fact that you just coincidentally happen to have very small variance in some cases. Okay, that's Lima. Finally, I gotta, I gotta jump on my course here, because multiple testing correction is something critical. We are back at our study. Again, we have HNE1 versus HNE0, and here I have my set of probes. Each probe has these three measurements versus three, these three measurements, and I want to know which ones are different. How many probes did we have on the microarray data we were looking at this morning? Anyone remember? 61. More than 60,000 probes on one microarray, and that's a fairly old microarray, 60,000. If you are to compare each gene for, in a t-test, if you're going to compare each probe in a t-test, you're going to run 60,000 t-tests. 60,000. What is the probability that an individual t-test working in data that have no real differences will produce a p-value of less than 0.05? When there's no real difference, what is the chance that a given t-test will find a, will, will produce a p-value of less than 0.05? I'm going to pause on that question. Does anyone know? People don't know this one. Well, that's interesting. Okay. I will say, say then that the values of the p values that come from t test, when there is no real difference, are uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. Do people know what that looks like, uniformly distributed? A couple of people are nodding their heads, but I want to make sure everybody gets this. All right. If imagine that I have. Uh, a, a six-sided die. I throw this 
I'm going to get a value of 1, or I'm going to give it a value of 2, or I'm going to get a value of 3, or 4, or 5, or 6. What is the probability that I roll a 4 on a one-sided die? 1 in, in 6. It's got 6 sides. It has an equal chance of any one of those outcomes. All right. What if I have a 20-sided die and I roll this? What's its probability of rolling 17? 1 in 20. 1 in 20. It's got 20 sides. Therefore, the probability of rolling any one number is 1 in 20. If I have a die that's a marble, it's perfectly smooth, what's its chance that some number is going to show up less than 0.05? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but the, the, the principle is the same. The values that you get from t-test when there are no differences are evenly distributed from 0 to 1, which means that by random chance, we expect 5% of all t-tests, when there's no difference, will still produce a significant p-value. 5%. Let's return to this table now. I have 60,000 probes. I'm running a t-test on all of them. What number of those t-tests will produce a, a significant p-value given no difference whatsoever between cohorts? 5%. Which is? Anyone have this one? 60,000 divided by 20. Three thousand? Is that what we decided? Three thousand. Sixty thousand probes, if tested by t-test with no real difference, will produce three thousand false positives. That blows. If you get a significant p-value, you want to say, oh, this is differential. But just, from a, uh, just with no difference whatsoever, you're still going to get some values that, are, that appear significant. That is a really big problem. We can simulate this out. In this case, I have 1,000 microarrays. On each one, I am measuring 10,000 genes. For each one, I'm going to do five replicates with no difference. You see that I'm giving it no mean difference. Mean is zero, standard deviation is one. I'm just making A, uh, A five random values, and B five random values. And I'm going to compute a t-test value for it. Each time, for each microarray, I'm going to ask how many of them produced a significant p-value. In these 1,000 1, uh, uh, microarrays simulated, I had an average value of something like 440 false positives because we know there was no real difference, but still a healthy fraction of them showed up as significant. Be forewarned about this. If, it come, if I come to your master's defense and you do a thousand, uh, thousand t-tests and discover that a bunch of them give you significant p-values and don't take that into account, I will ask an uncomfortable question. Really, truly. And if I'm not there, Gerard will blow his top, his top about stuff like that. Just don't, don't bait him with that kind of red meat. So, be aware that if you do a bunch of t-tests, you have to multiply test correct. What are our solutions? You should ask me that. Because you don't want to throw out t-tests. You want to have that option. So, we do have some. First, you may be in a situation where you want to protect yourself against making any mistaken calls. In a case like that, you need to use Bonferroni correction, which was discovered by an American uh, female uh, statistician, actually. I, I'm trying to remember her name off the top of my head. But uh, she found that this, uh, this work by an Italian statistician way back in forever gave us a set of inequalities that we could use for, for this purpose. So being very humble, she named it after him. I thought that was kind of nice. So we might think a p-value below 0 0.05 is one that we're going to call significant if we were doing one test. Here, though, if we're doing 60,000 probes, we have to divide that by 60,000. And that means that if we can beat that threshold, we can make a claim that's, that's a real difference. That's pretty restrictive, though. How frequently have you seen a p-value 
that is, that is, better, uh, that is lower than 0 0.05 divided by 60,000. That's a hefty requirement. Remember that this is trying to protect us against making any errors, and it might be sufficient to protect us from a certain fraction of errors rather than making any errors. For that, we have our good friend Benjamin E. Hochberg. This is frequently called FDR correction, and people use it all the time in biology, so I hope you uh, learn about it here. So imagine that we've sorted all of our p-values, right? We've just started with our table and we've sorted from the lowest p-value to the best. We want to know which of these we can keep and which we've got to chuck. For something like this, we're going to use a different threshold for each value in that series. So we're going to start by dividing 1 by 60,000, if you've got 60,000 tests, multiply that by 0.05. That criterion a lot of these studies can achieve. Is your lowest value below that? If so, it's a pass. Then we look at the second value. You see that these are, these are examples of our p-values gradually escalating as we get further and further through the list. We've done 50 comparisons here. Now, I would say in my department, if you are working with Luminex data, you're frequently measuring, say, 44 cytokines. And for something like this, you're looking at a situation very analogous to this. You've got a p-value for each of the cytokines sorted from lowest p-value to highest, and you figure out how many of those you're going to call differential with Benjamin E. Hochberg correction. We already used an example of this last Tuesday in the statistics practical. So we have a slowly escalating threshold with a more rapidly rising p-value set. So Benjamin E. Hochberg becomes the most common method people use for multiple testing correction. Now you've seen it graphically explained, hopefully um, it will be easier for you to use. Now, there's an awful lot of grousing about multiple testing correction, and I, I want to walk through these. The number one thing I hear is that all my hits vanished when I applied multiple testing correction. Now, this first is kind of a pithy remark. I hope you'll bear with me. Maybe the null distribution was correct. Maybe the null hypothesis was right. Maybe there really is no difference. Your PI sent you out doing this experiment under the, under the hypothesis that if you treated these with tree sap and these with water, you were going to get a significant difference, but you didn't. Sometimes biology is like that. Sometimes your PI is just wrong. They sent you on a wild goose chase, and there is, in fact, no biological difference to be measured. Sometimes this happens. Maybe your experiment was underpowered. If someone sets out to do a comparison experiment, what do they, uh, how many uh, of each cohort do they typically run? The number here is three. At least three. You'll hear people give different rationales for why you should do three replicates, but most frequently the answer is they think that t-test will only work if you have at least three replicates. Science is expensive. Grants never have as much money in them as you'd like, and as a result, we typically do the smallest number of, of tests that we actually can. As a result, you will very frequently find people doing three on three comparisons. Maybe you have two different variables going at the same time. You've got young people and old people, men and women, for example, and in each group you've done three. Now you've done an experiment of 12. That's a big study, right? But in fact, it's not very big. It may be that you've done so few replicates because of budgetary constraints that you can't get a p-value that will actually let you prove your hypothesis. Or fail to disprove it anyway, let's put it that way. So, sometimes the experimental designs we use have too few replicates to answer the questions that we've got. As a result, the p-values are weak, and the p-values cannot surmount the multiple testing correction that is necessary. Next up, Dr. X published without MTC, so why must I? Can't I, go, can't I just do away with multiple testing correction since this person who works at this big expensive lab in Europe can get away without using it? No. First off, Dr. X has probably been in the business longer than you have. As a result, people are more inclined to believe his say-so even if he's basically a blowhard who doesn't know anything about statistics. Free people frequently allow major laboratories to get away with things they would never let a junior investigator do. 
This is shocking and awful, but it is also true. So, just because people publish bad statistics does not mean you need to emulate them. I'm going to tell you the, 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 the Liebler rule. It's actually a Wilheimer rule, but that's okay. We're going to use both of my old collaborators' names on this one. Five is the new three. When your investigator asks you to do three replicates of this, three replicates of that, and you'll get an answer to your question, I want you to counter to your PI, you know, I'm concerned that some of these data may not turn up. I want to propose that we do five replicates instead. Five on five gives you much more power than three on three. So if, if, you, are, if you hold in your mind, anytime someone says to me, I'm going to do three replicates, try doing five instead. If you, can, if you can get away with the cost, it's almost always worth it. All right. The next thing I see is people who are misusing t-test, because they know how to do t-test, and they don't know how to do other things. So in some cases, people do five different groups. I have, um, I have plants that I grew in swampy soil, in salty soil, in acidic soil, basic soil, and ordinary happy soil. All right. Now I'm going to look for differences. Well, how am I going to do it? I'm going to compare swampy to sandy, swampy to acid, swampy to basic, swampy to whatever, and then I'm going to go and do uh, basic versus acidic, basic versus whatever. Look at that. What an awful situation. We have five different levels of a variable. What kind of soil are these plants growing in? And we're comparing them in a pairwise way. But look at the math of this. In this case, we have five people at a party and so there are 10 different handshakes we can do. It's the same problem. We have five different soil types, and there are 10 different pairings of soil types. That's a big problem. So now we're going to do 10 comparisons. We've already brought ourselves right back into a multiple testing correction problem. Not because we have a large number of genes, but because we have a large number of pairwise comparisons. This is not the right test to use in a circumstance like this. That's an ANOVA problem. Performing your experiment took a lot of your time and attention. Analyzing it also requires time and attention. You should know how you're going to analyze the data even before you perform the experiment. I want to remind you of the great words of Ronald Cosa, who wrote, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess. Your job is not to turn bad data into significant p-values. That is an abuse of statistics, and it means that you'll be publishing false information. Don't fall into that trap ever. When you have data that have an inconclusive solution, the answer is not to squeeze them until you get something that looks like a, a p-value that's low. There are plenty of, of toolkits out there that will run uncritically whatever test you ask them to of the data you've got. And sooner or later, one of them will give you a p-value. That does not mean, oh good, I get to publish. You need to be able to justify the methods that you use. We've already talk, talked about ubiquitous volcano plots. Volcano plots show up all over the place. Whenever we have full changes and, and p-values, we did an example of working through computing these back on Tuesday in the Statistics Practical. So I hope you can uh, look at those to remind yourselves what volcano plots are all about. Rapidly, we see people using fewer and fewer hybridization-based assays, like microarrays, for doing gene expression. It's been giving up a lot of ground to RNA-seq because people are excited about what they can discover in their data sets because of RNA-seq. Uh, however, before you set out on a big RNA-seq adventure, keep in mind that this is going to require a lot more load in bioinformatics for you to make sense of your data. There are lots of, lots of cases in which it makes more sense for you to stick with the older microarray technique. Plots to visualize data quality and key measures of performance are vital to understanding complex issues that can crop up in these experiments. Don't die of batch effects. You want to have your experiment fly because you're able to normalize away uh, all sorts of bias that appear in your experiments. Systems biology can easily yield situations where multiple testing is a problem. Bonferroni is, is good, but very few experiments survive it. Instead, you should probably know how to make use of Benjamin E. Hochberg for controlling the false discovery rate in your experiments. 
I realized that was a lot of material. I, I waxed on a fair amount of time. I'm still within two hours, so I feel happy about that. Tomorrow, we have a late start. We have a late start. We're not going to start our practical at 9 o'clock. We're going to start it at 10 o'clock, which means that if you have an 8.30 or a 9 meeting, you will probably make it. But be back in this room at 10 o'clock for our practical in proteomics and structural biology. I'm really excited about where we're turning in the next couple days. So I'll see you tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. Thank you, everybody.